Welcome to the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast with Robert Glasscock. I'm Thomas Miller, and Robert and I just recently completed a wonderful series of what we're calling speed readings. We worked with 25 different people. Robert, you think we kind of got this down now after 25 of them? (laughs) I hope so. (laughs) Yeah, it was awesome. And a lot of the great questions that came up, but one of them was, Basically, somebody who wanted to know what was the strongest influence or the strongest planet in their chart. And we thought that would be something that would be a great podcast to just isolate by itself. So, Robert, if somebody wanted to know of those 10 placements, what's the strongest one influencing me? Where do you go with that? Well, that's something that you can argue with for the rest of your life, but it's worth arguing about because it can have a number of different answers, and it's up to you to determine. But a place to start is the ruler of your ascending sign, because the ascendant is the moment that you have chosen to incarnate here. So the ascendant and the sign and the degree of the ascendant, which all have sub-rulerships, but the ruler, the planetary ruler of your ascendant is a big place to start because it becomes your chart ruler or your life ruler. I'm born with Capricorn rising. Saturn is my life ruler. I happen to have Saturn in detriment in Cancer, but it's also in the seventh house, so it's accidentally dignified. So these are all methods for getting at the strongest planet in the chart. So the chart ruler, the planet ruling your ascendant sign, that's one way to go. The planet in highest elevation at the top of your chart, if you have one, that's another good indicator of this potentially the strongest planet in your chart. Another one is final dispositor, which means is there a single planet in your chart that ultimately disposes of or rules all the other planets? And you have to track this out. If you follow the chain of command, the moon in Aries is ruled by Mars. Mars is in Libra. It's ruled by Venus. Venus is in Scorpio. Oh, Venus and Mars are in mutual reception. They're in each other's signs. Do you see Venus is in Scorpio, a Mars-ruled sign? Mars is in Libra, a Venus-ruled sign. So when you have mutual reception like that, and look it up if you don't understand, go to Google. But those planets in mutual reception can be read in their same degrees, but back in their home sides. And if you trace the rulerships of planets, you might come to a single planet that ultimately disposes of or rules all of the other planets, in which case that is another good candidate for the strongest planet in the chart. That's called final dispositor. And those are the three main things to look at. Your sun, of course, is the life force, so it's always a strong planet. But it may be overpowered by another planet that's above it in terms of elevation or in terms of rulership of the ascendant and so on. But those are the three three key things to look at. Okay, so what you're saying is that those are the stronger influences, those three, but there is no concept of the strongest. Is that correct? Uh, Yeah, I think that's asking a little simplistic approach to astrology because different planets in different contexts will be the strongest but those three the ruler of your ascendant the planet that rules that is certainly your life ruler that sign in that planet and second of all if you have a planet highly elevated up in your ninth or tenth house that planet of highest elevation is also a strong planet but you don't want to try and start splitting hairs between which one of those is strongest because in different kind your life ruler is your life ruler. I'm ruled by Saturn. I have Capricorn rising, so there's no getting around that, which means I have to grow up. <laughs> I have to become Saturnian. I have to become mature and so on. And believe me, that wasn't necessarily easy for me. I'm a Libra. I'm supposed to get through life as easily and happily and as much fun as possible. Well, Saturn rules me, and so I've had to learn how to be mature and responsible and organized and all of the Saturnian things. But the highest planet in my chart is actually Mars and Venus, those two. And in my chart, they're interchangeable. Mars is in Libra and Venus is in Scorpio. So they're both at the top of my chart and they're in mutual reception, meaning they're in each other's signs. So I can read them back and forth with their same degrees, but in their own own signs. So those two are very strong. 
in my chart, Mars and Venus, would I say they're stronger than Saturn? In some contexts, they are, certainly in terms of my career. But in other, um, in other contexts, Saturn is stronger. You know, one of the questions we were going to tackle anyway is mutual reception and why it is important in a chart. So while we're right here, you're on it. Why don't we just carry that a little bit further? You just described what it is, but let's set that up again. We'll put Robert's chart in the show notes so you can watch and follow along and get a visual of this. So just check the show notes for Robert's chart. There's a download or a view link there. Okay. Mutual reception are where you have two or maybe more, but two planets in each other's signs. So in my case, I have Venus and Scorpio, which is ruled by the contemporary ruler, Pluto. But the old Chaldean ruler of Scorpio is Mars. And lo and behold, I have Mars in Libra, which is in Venus's sign. So I can read both Venus and Mars back in their home signs, but retaining the same birth degree. So I have Mars at 22 Libra. I can also read it back at 22 Scorpio and make, it, and make new aspects with it. I have Venus at 4 degrees Scorpio, but I can read it back in Libra at four degrees Libra, where it makes additional aspects from that mutual reception position. So mutual receptions are very interesting because they give you a way to not only get into anything, but also a way to get out of anything, if you're conscious of them. So with me, I would have to consciously remind myself of what Venus at four degrees Libra means. Because, in fact, my Venus is at four degrees Scorpio. But because it is in Mars's sign, I can read it back in its own sign, vice versa with Mars. Mars is at 22 degrees Libra, but I can read it back at 22 degrees Scorpio in its own sign, where it makes a different aspect, aspects that I would not know about if I didn't know about mutual reception. And it's great, because I have a fairly unaspected Mercury until... I move Mars, which is at 22 Libra, it kind of sextiles that, that Mercury and so on. So you wind up, if you're aware of mutual reception, getting aspects consciously that you would not have seen otherwise. So always look for that. Okay, so you've identified strong planets in your chart from one of three sources, like we talked about. And, and we could even say, like here, the highest mutual reception. But Dispositor, highest in the horizon, and then the ruler of the ascendant. All right, then what do you do with it? I mean, like you were saying, with your Capricorn, and I'm Gemini, so i got to be talking into a microphone somewhere. Uh, <laughs> what do you do with that as far as conscious living? Well, you just keep thinking about what it means in the positions where they are, about what house they are in, what house they rule, what aspects they make. If they're hard aspects, how do you handle those? If they're easy aspects, how do you capitalize on those and develop them and so on? So it's, it's really just like reading the chart as a whole anyway. But with a special awareness, all right, this, this planet is my chart ruler. It's my life ruler. And when I first got into astrology and the old books were fairly fatalistic, I thought, uh-oh, my life is ruled by Saturn in Cancer and these horrible aspects, these squares – this grand cross to my sun-moon opposition and this opposite my ascendant Saturn is. This is horrible. And it is. The old books made it sound even worse than it. And I remember thinking when I first got into this, this is a horrible chart. Can I do anything about this? And, of course, the answer is yes. That's the whole point of astrology. It's not to live out your fate unconsciously or negatively. It's what can I do about this? Because you have stress aspects for a reason. You are meant to experience stress in those areas because you're meant to focus on them and determine what do these areas of life mean for me. And as a result of what you discover, you begin to act accordingly. So I've had to learn, for example, with my Grand Cross, I am a Libra. I like people. I like everybody. And I did as a kid, but I had to learn the hard way to discriminate in who I chose to spend time with, and certainly who I chose to fall in love with. So I've had to learn to be discriminating in the people that I, I spend my time with. So it's turned out to be a terrific chart. 
I'll yeah. stick mine in there too, and I have Mercury as the chart ruler, but it's in detriment because it's in Sagittarius. So am I stepping on my tongue a lot and having to retrace things? <clears throat> Well, and it's conjunct Jupiter, too. So it's in Sagittarius, which is opposite its ruler, uh, opposite Gemini. So it is detrimented. Uh, but, and, and, but so you have to study, what does that mean, being in detriment? And what do you think, Mercury in Sagittarius? Because it can be an incredibly terrific position. Well, the, <laughs> like going into the ministry, for example, one of the first sermons that I preached, quote unquote, I had to go apologize for. Why did you have to apologize? What did you say? I was too attacking. <laughs> well, that's exactly what that condition is. You've got Mercury and Jupiter both in Sag. Basically, you're a know-it-all. But, but the truth is, you really do know a lot. But they square Pluto. And that's the need to control. And it's totally unconscious. Pluto always is. But that's the need to be right all the time. And to be something of a dictator all the time, unconsciously. So one of the lessons in life that you have to learn is compromise. And that's very hard for you. You're a Scorpio and it's black or white. It's uh, it's a pretty uncompromising and often very self-righteous position unless you get in touch with it because it's really a fabulous aspect for exactly what you're doing for a mass commu a communicator of philosophy of ideas of spirituality of consciousness of metaphysics and of healing and all of those things and that's the positive side of it it's an, an incredible speaker and leader mercury speaking and, and jupiter and so on are broadcasting in the sixth house of work and healer absolutely you would have made a hell of a physician if you'd gone to medical school well in truth, you're a metaphysical healer, a spiritual healer. Well, with that aspect, I was marched into the general manager's office of a television station when I was getting ready to be a senior in college. So I was 21 years old, and I was hired as the 6 and 10 news anchor for that television station <laughs> on the spot in blue jeans and a T-shirt. So, but yeah. man, what confidence building at that age. Yep. Did it for several years. To be years. given that position, that is certainly a, a, a huge reinforcement of, hey, this is a path to pay attention to. But see, there's what you're talking about. So there's the positive side. Yes, it was recognized by my broadcast professor who walked me in there, by the general manager who took his advice and took a chance on me and saw that I was capable even at 21 years old, literally was doing the 6 and 10 p.m. news for an ABC television station, an ABC uh, affiliate. In a small market, tiny market, but nonetheless. Yeah, it doesn't matter. The size doesn't matter. But yeah, that's amazing. And yet there was the sermon that I had to apologize for that took place several years before that. <laughs> well, too, you know, the, the really nice thing with this chart is all that Scorpio stelium that you have is ruled by Mars in its home sign, Scorpio, and by Pluto, which sextiles that Scorpio stelium. And the Pluto sextile gives you the capacity for this kind of deeper understanding that, yes, indeed, there are other opinions out there that are equally valid to mine, and I can I can learn from those and deal with those very effectively and, and positively with the sextile from Pluto. But the instinct, and this is from birth, uh, you were born into a very dictatorial family. Those in a fundamentalist family, in a way, and those are very rigid. They have very rigid roles for men and women, and what you believe, and what you can say, and what you can do, and what you cannot do, and what it's, it's all about the rules and control. And that's where you were born. And so you're born having to fight for yourself, whether you knew that or not. And you tried a lot, you tried a long time to conform, I think, to their expectations. I mean, that's when my mom and I started to get into it was when I did leave that path to the ministry and went into television and then boom, the fireworks began. All right. Think about this, Thomas. The biggest threat to organized religion is education. And this is why the Catholic Church fought the Gutenberg printing press, because for the first time in human history, anybody could own a Bible and they didn't want anybody to own a Bible. They wanted just them to own the Bibles. Before the printing press, you had to be able to afford to pay a monk 
$20,000 to hand copy his teacher's Bible and so on, hand illustrate it. So education and knowledge, the minute you got into broadcasting, your parents thought, "Uh uh-oh, he's going to be exposed to knowledge of the outer world. He has to be because he's in broadcast media now. He's reaching a large, he's going to start learning things that are in conflict with what we believe. And that's the truth. The minute you get out, the minute you go to college, unless you go to a religious college, that is a threat to fundamentalist religions because they know you're going to meet people who don't believe the way that they do and meet and get information that conflicts with what they believe. This is why they like to send you to a religious school so that you stay within the tribe. But you with Mercury and Jupiter and Sag, basically, you want to know the whole world. You want to travel. You want to think. You definitely want to get outside the box. And that becomes a threat. So that's why that started when it did at that age, because they realize, uh oh, suddenly you were out in the world and it was no longer constricted by the family belief system. So from that day forward, you were a threat. I was mandated to go to a Christian university because, and these were the exact words from my mom, if I went to one of those big secular schools, they'd turn me into a communist. Yeah. See there, I mean, this is paranoia. That's what this is. I don't mean to get off into religion and politics here, but it's kind of hard not to with your Mercury and Jupiter and Sag. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other thing we won't talk about, that That's I could right. have been a politician. <laughs> yeah, well, and you still are. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for this great insight. Really appreciate it. And if you'd like to talk to Robert about a reading for your own self, go to the show notes. The Both charts, our, uh, Robert's and mine, are in there as well, so you can be sure to see those. Thank you guys so much for listening. We'll see you next time on the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast with Robert Glasscock.